through the darkness of future past. The magician longs to see one chance out between two worlds. Fiero, drive with me. So I want to start off with a correction. In the last episode, I said that there were three hoses going to the gas tank when there are actually five. I forgot to mention these two, the filler hose and the filler breather hose. And here are the three I showed last time going to the fuel pump assembly. So yeah, now that that's out of the way, let's jump straight into working. As important as getting this car to where it can move under its own power is, it is equally important to be able to stop, if not more. So just about all of the braking system needs to be redone. Maybe not the booster and master cylinder, but everything else for sure. Once we got the wheels off, my brother and I got to work taking the calipers off. The bolts and brake hose for the front one came off easily, but the caliper itself needed a little persuasion. Jesus. Back in part one, I mentioned that I stripped the lower bolt for this caliper. So we ended up having to tear off the rubber boot around the bolt head, get a pair of vice grips around it, and turn the bolt with the vice grips while also turning a ratchet with the correct Torx driver in there. It was a pain, but we got it out. And this caliper too needed a few love taps. The e-brake spring was also taken off back in part one, but I still needed to take off the bracket holding the cable in place. This side came off fine, but the passenger side was a different story. It would not budge at all when it was on the car, so we had to undo the plastic retainer and slide the cable out. We attempted to take off the bolt with our impact driver, but as you can see, it was not working. We tried penetrating fluid, heat, a stern talking to, but the bolt wouldn't budge, so we just decided to leave it be. But with the rest of the calibers off, the remaining boots and slide pins were pulled out. Yeah, they come with the little things. Okay. And with a bit more work, here are the brakes in a Null-esque view. A lot of modern calipers are in two pieces, with a caliper and a caliper bracket, but these are just one single piece. The boots and slide pins are the exact same for the front and rear, but where the two calipers start to differ is with the pistons. The front is what you typically see on any front caliper, but the piston is made from a composite material and has a metal cap, where most are just one piece and it's all metal. These are called phenolic pistons, apparently. The rear ones are where it gets really strange. It's still typical piston mechanics for normal braking, but for the e-brake, it makes use of a lead screw that pushes the piston outward when the cable is actuated. Not only is there a spring inside the cylinder, but there is also a spring inside the piston itself. This is all super weird stuff, but hey, it's probably just because of all the cocaine from the 80s. To show you how these left ones came apart, I'll take you along with the right side. The remaining washers were taken off the back of the rear caliper. Then the lead screw was rotated as far in as possible. Maximum thread engagement is very important here since the whole thing is going in a vise. And the piston is pressed out with the help of various sized sockets. The front caliper, being the more typical of the two, requires some pressure to get the piston out. On my ZR7S, back when I rebuilt the front brake caliper for that, I was able to pump the brakes with the caliper still plumbed. Since this caliper is already off, compressed air works too. With a rubber tip, this is relatively easy work. Well, it should be. The left side came off in seconds, but this side wasn't budging, even after trying penetrating fluid and heat. This was the one that was seized that caused the vehicle to be parked for 20 years, so I can't really say I'm surprised. We ended up having to take it to our local mechanic friends, and they used an air chisel to break away the piston. Since again, this was made of phenolic plastic, it was really easy to do. Once it was back, I gave the calipers a good cleaning just to make handling them a little more pleasant. Degreaser and the wire brush did a lot, but they still weren't perfect. They will be cleaned up more later, but in the meantime, let's go back to the car itself. The rotors are rusted to heck and need to be replaced. Lots of rotors have a small screw that threads into the hub just to keep it in place when the wheel is off. But this car has these little metal clip things. But once they're off, the rotor can come off too. And the same thing was done for the other side. 
So while the calipers are drying after being degreased and cleaned, I'm going to install the rotors on the rear of the car. Now the rear ones are really easy to install uh, just because all you have to do is take off the old one like we showed you and put the new one back on. That's really straightforward. The front ones are a little bit more difficult. I'll get to that in a little bit, but I'm going to go ahead and install this right now. My brother already sanded the surface off camera as well as got a wire brush around the studs. So now all I have to do is add some anises to make taking it off in the future if need be uh, a lot easier. On the original one, there were some locking tabs that went around the studs that held it in place. But those aren't really necessary, they just help with keeping everything where it should be. But in the meantime, I'm just going to add some uh, of the lugs back on just to make sure it doesn't fall off. Let's go do the other side. On the other side, I told you guys that my brother already sanded the surface off camera and you can see why he did that. This is just really rusty and really dirty. And now for the front ones. These are pretty typical for front wheels that aren't driven. The rotor is clearly already removed, but to give you an idea of how it goes together, I'll take it off in reverse order, which is also called putting it back on. Here is the rotor itself, and in the back of it, a tapered roller bearing is set in place. A small seal also goes on the back of it, but I won't press it in for this demonstration. The rotor is then slid on the spindle, and a front tapered roller bearing is pushed into place as well. And everything is secured with a washer and a nut, and that's about it. Oh, and there's a cap to keep out dust and water too. But unfortunately, the new front rotors are not as easy to install as the new rear ones. The tapered roller bearings roll around on bearing races, and they are pressed into place. They have to go all the way down to this little lip that's visible, and it's not as easy as them just falling into place. It's not just the inner one, but the outer one as well. There was going to be a separate Saturday Projects video showing how I made a DIY hydraulic press with the use of a car jack, but it failed terribly. I knew it wasn't going to handle a lot of force, but it didn't handle any before warping and totally not working at all. There most definitely should have been a beam going all the way across the bottom, and more importantly a brain in my head when I made this, but it was a good welding exercise, so I can't really complain too much. So if no hydraulic press, it's back to the primitive yet effective hammer and auto zone bearing race installer kit. Yeah, definitely use a hydraulic press for this if you can. Oh, also I put the bearings in their freezer before driving them in, since they shrink a little when that's done. The whole process was the exact same as before, but this time a split pin is used to secure the nut in place. But taking things a little slower and showing the whole process, let's go over to the driver's side. Is that okay? Yeah! Cool. The cover is pried off with a flathead screwdriver, and the split pin pulled out with a set of pliers. Do notice how easy it is to break loose the nut. It's not meant to be tight, since these bearings are tapered. If the nut was tightened down to a high torque value, the bearings would be crushed and wouldn't spin properly, if at all. So with that removed, along with the washer, the whole rudder can come out, along with some tasty snacks. Some dead beetles in there, and also looks like a dead caterpillar. Delicious. The spindle was wiped clean and examined for any scarring, but everything looks good, so it's bearing time. There's a trick to packing grease, and that is to apply some in your hand and push the bearing down into it. I probably could have used the grease gun, but I saw this online and wanted to try it out. And after the bearing was in, the seal was tapped into place with a hammer. The outer bearing was greased up in the exact same way. Fudge. The washer was put back on and the nut tightened down, but not too tight, only to where it's firm and where the bearings are still seated properly so they can rotate easily, like I mentioned before. The new split pin is installed in the cap too. And that's both rotors fully installed. But that's both rotors fully installed. There's something missing. The studs. 
it's kind of important to be able to attach wheels to a car, so let's install some new ones. It's pretty straightforward, but all you do is get one of those new studs, take it from behind and slip it into a hole. It doesn't matter which one. Put on some washers, an old lug nut, and impact drive the bejeebus out of it until it seats. It will start to make a different sound when it's all the way in. But hey, look at that, a new stud in place. I actually forgot to add a lubricant to the threads on the first one. It's super helpful to add a liberal amount of anti-seize on the stud. The lug nut goes on more smoothly and it reduces the risk of messing anything up. This trick, along with the whole process of installing the studs, was learned from the Bleep and Jeep YouTube channel. Personally, I don't really care for trucks or off-roading very much, but they have some pretty great stuff. With that done, however, and the other side done off-camera, the brake lines need to be taken care of. The back ones were unthreaded and had the bracket removed from the frame, but the front ones were a bit more tricky. There are rivets holding them in place on the control arms, so those need to go. I did try drilling them out at first, but I kept breaking bits, so I decided to just use my angle grinder with a cutoff wheel to take care of them. There's that. Okay, well, now I can install the new lines. Whoa, 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 hold your horses, Ronnie. You still need to take care of the old rusty brackets. Fuck, you're right. I know. So, these brackets were sprayed down with degreaser, scrubbed a crap ton with a scotch bright pad, soaked in a vinegar bath for a few days, and painted a nice black to restore them to their former glory. Now, they can go back on. So the rubber brake line is now connected to the hard line like you saw me just do, and the only thing to do now is to rivet it back onto the control arm to be secured in place. However, I'm not going to do that, at least not right now. I do plan to take apart the whole suspension, uh, the control arms and everything, and repaint them along with get new bushings and ball joints and whatnot. So because I'm going to do all that stuff, and especially the painting part, I'm not going to bolt it down now because it'll be a hassle and just get in the way later. So I'm probably going to zip tie it just to keep it secure temporarily. And after I do all that stuff, I'll put it in, in its final spot with a rivet. With those done, the final thing to do before final assembly is rebuild those calipers. The parts, including the rotors and brake lines from earlier, were all purchased from Rock Auto and are ready to be installed. Believe it or not, these are the same calipers from earlier. My friend from work was kind enough to bead blast them for me. Thanks again, Rusty. These are aluminum, so they don't need to be painted, except for the steel bracket. And speaking of steel, that's where the new front pistons are. The rear pistons are still the originals, but all seals and rubber pieces are brand new. And also off camera, I took out all the seals, including the slide seals, as well as the square cut and dust seal that actually goes inside the piston on all the calipers. So now we have all the new seals ready to be put in. This may be a little confusing to watch two people rebuild these at the exact same time, since my dad and I aren't going at the exact same pace, but hopefully it's still easy enough to follow along. The first thing we did was put all of the seals for the piston inside a little container of brake fluid, just to make sure there's plenty of lubrication when they're installed and no snags happen. And while they're soaking, we installed the o-rings and boots for the slide pins. They are a little finicky, so a tiny screwdriver was used to help set them in place. And once they're all in, the square cut seal is added inside the cylinder of each caliper. And that goes on really easily. The dust seal is then fitted around the piston and set into the groove. Both the piston and the cylinder are given a good coating of brake fluid, and then the piston is pushed in. It's a really tight fit, as it's supposed to be, so a C-clamp had to be used in order to press the piston in all the way. The dust seals were then pushed down onto the recession in the caliper, and that's both front ones fully completed. The backs start off the same way as the front. The seals go on for the slide pins, and then the square cut seal is added inside the bore of the caliper. The pistons were cleaned up with a scotch bright pad since they are the originals, and now is where it gets a little tricky because of the springs. They make inserting the piston a real pain in the ass, not to mention the lead screw that has to line up with the hole in the back. We found that inserting the lead screw, with a new o-ring of course, all the way in first, and then pressing the piston in was easiest. 
The elite screw was then rotated to where there is thread engagement, and then the C-clamp was used again to compress everything. And since the threads are so steep, the elite screw just rotated as the piston went in, which is exactly how it's supposed to operate. I should also mention that each piston and lead screw are specific to the side of the car they're on. The threads are reversed from one another, so if you do this, try not to mix up which goes where. And with the dust seals and slide pin boots on, that's all the calipers, completely rebuilt. To start the installation, the part of the knuckle the caliper slides next to was sanded smooth to get rid of any rust, and then brake grease was applied to those surfaces. After that, the slide pin holes got a liberal coating of grease, as well as the new pads where they make contact with the caliper and the piston, just to minimize brake noise. The caliper was bolted up with the new hardware after it was slid on. I also should mention that the rotor was sprayed down with brake cleaner earlier, that way the oils put on the part from the factory are completely removed. This was actually done for this rotor as soon as I took it out of the box weeks before installing it, which is why it already started rusting a teeny bit. The brake hose was attached with a new banjo bolt and crush washers. The bleeder valve was installed in the back, and then I was ready to move on to the other side, which was the exact same process. The rear calipers are also pretty much the exact same as the front. The only difference is dealing with the extra e-brake components, which really isn't a lot either. The plastic and rubber washers were added to the back of the lead screw, and then the arm was secured with a nut. The e-brake cable was fed through and secured to the bracket, and then the spring was installed. But where does that go exactly? Right here. Okay. Nice. That was in that bed, and that is up in there. So that was probably what I was worrying about the most, but it's on there perfectly fine. It wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. All right, well, I'm going to go inside the car and pull the e-brake lever, and this right here should swing down, and the spring should compress. Hopefully. Hey, it looks like it did it. Okay, so that's awesome. That means everything here is working fine. Now I just need to go do the other side, and then after that, I can bleed the entire system, and... Hopefully, I'll only have to bleed the clutch as well, and then this thing should be ready for its first test drive. I am prepared to eat those words. The other side was installed smoothly as well, and now, all of the brakes are fully rebuilt and on the car. Time for some bleeding. And now let's bleed the brakes. For this, you want to start with the farthest caliper from the master cylinder and work your way to the closest. While the rear passenger side is physically located farthest from it, the rear driver side has the longest brake line going to it, so that's the first one to bleed. It's not a really exciting process, and neither is bleeding the clutch system, which we did next, so let's quickly move past those and onto seeing what happens when the car is put in gear. With the clutch pedal pressed in, the car is not wanting to shift into any gear. After a bunch of messing around, I did manage to get it into a gear, except there was a problem. I never let off the clutch pedal, yet the rotors were still spinning. The wheels were put back on the car and I lowered it down. I thought I may have some luck getting it into gear now, for whatever reason, but still nothing. There was full travel happening with the slave cylinder, that was certain. So what was going on? Hi, I'm Ronnie from Six Months in the Future. These videos are filmed half a year before they're released. What was happening with the car was that the clutch plate was seized to the flywheel. Normally when the clutch pedal is pressed, they're supposed to disengage from each other, but that wasn't happening. So essentially, whenever the car was in gear, the engine would be spinning the input shaft of the transmission, even if the clutch pedal was pressed. Now I did find a solution to fix this, and that was from an online article from 1996. I was actually three months old when it came out. What you're supposed to do is raise the car up off the ground and put it on jack stands. Then you start it in a high gear, for example, fifth gear for this car. That way the wheels will be spinning. Then, with the clutch pedal pressed in, you slowly press on the brakes. So 
So what this does is stops the input shaft of the transmission from spinning, which forces the clutch plate to stop spinning. And when that happens, the clutch plate is forced to separate from the flywheel, freeing up the entire system. It's as simple as that. However, it can get even simpler with dumb luck. I could just raise the car up and do the procedure that I talked about, but taking worst case scenarios into account, that wouldn't be so smart. It would be ideal to have the car facing out of the barn. That way, if the car were to fall off the jack stands while the wheels were spinning in high gear, I wouldn't go flying forward into a wall. However unlikely that may be, it's still a possibility. So my girlfriend and I were going to push the car out of the barn, turn it around in the field, and push it back in. I said were because after completing the second part of the three point turn we were attempting, the car rolled too far forward and got to a point where it was stuck in place. The short gravel driveway we have for the barn goes down rather abruptly on this side, so it was too difficult to push the car back up. This is where the dumb luck comes in. I thought the best way to get it out was to start the car in reverse and with the clutch not pressed in. The neutral safety switch is either bypassed or broken, so that can be done. In trying to just get the car out of the grass, I actually freed up the clutch. I guess that was because I slammed on the brakes to stop, but holy sh**, the car is about to drive for the first time in 20 years. Once we got back, I gave the car a good look over, just to find out if there were any issues or problems that immediately stood out. The clutch and brake master cylinders looked good on fluid, and there were no leaks. But there was an issue back here in the engine bay. Since the battery tray is messed up and rusted through, it wasn't securing the battery too well. It slid over while driving, and the water pump pulley was eating away at the plastic casing of the battery. This is what I was referring to in part 1 of the series. But everything else in the engine bay seemed fine. Inside the car, there were some problems. We had the oil pressure gauge, speedometer, and the odometer working, but that's about it. We already know the fuel gauge is never going to work, at least with the current sender that is rusted through in the tank, but the tack is reading a constant 4000 RPM, and the coolant gauge isn't moving in the slightest bit, even after running the car for quite a while. This concerns me since I don't know how well the car is being cooled, especially since the radiator fan isn't coming on. That right there is a big issue. There's also the fact that the headlights aren't popping up, so night driving isn't a possibility. However, the car does drive after all these years. Taking care of all those issues I mentioned is what's coming next. So, until next time, I'll see you guys later. Yeah.